and ransom captive Israel that mourns a lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. First McKinney, uh, we want to say welcome to our Sunday morning services today. Most of you know, and we're online today because our pastor, Sam Holm, Dr. Sam Holm, and our worship leader and pastor, Justin Hornsby, both tested positive for COVID this week. They're doing well, and I actually spoke with Sam this morning. He's feeling better today. Y'all just need to pray that Sam will rest because he doesn't do that well. And uh, I think Justin, he rests well, so he should, be, he should be good to go. But we really are grateful that you're tuning in today and listening to our service and being a part of it. And we just want to say welcome to First McKinney. We love this season of the year. We're going to be talking about the Advent in the service. And obviously, we'll be singing some songs that are, um, that are about the season and, so, and about Jesus, which is what we're all about all the time. So God bless you. Hey, let's pray, and we'll begin our services this morning. Father in heaven, Lord, we just want to say thanks for, uh, Lord, just that you're in charge of all the things of the earth, Lord, and, and we obviously and clearly are not. And God, thanks for Sam and Justin. Pray you'd heal them up uh, quickly. Lord, thanks for this amazing season, God. And we never want to take it for granted. Some of us have been Christ followers for a long, long time. Never want to take it for granted that, that Jesus came into the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so we just want to say thanks this morning, and God, as we worship and as we, as we study your word and as we listen for you, God, I pray that you'd speak to us all. And Lord, again, thanks for First McKinney, for the ministry we have in our city, in our, our nation, and in our world. And God, thanks again for the privilege of worshiping together, even today, in our homes with our families. You're good and faithful, and we love you, and, and uh, we, we bless you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Welcome to our home. I'm Holly. I'm Maddie. I'm Addison. Justin is here and he's feeling well and Cayman is here, but we are here to worship with you. So sing with us.
Hey, hey we're, we're the Willis, Willis family. family. On this second Sunday of Advent, as we reflect on the coming of Jesus Christ, we light the candle of anticipation. For centuries, the people of God anticipated the coming of the Messiah to bring salvation to the world. Today, we look back with great joy at Christ's first coming and look forward with great hope to his second coming. Acts 1, 11. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Revelations 22, 7. Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the word of the prophecies written in the scroll. Let us pray. Merciful God, always with us, always coming. We confess that we do not know how to prepare for your advent. We have forgotten how to hope in miracles. We have ignored the promises of your kingdom. We get distracted by all the business of the season. Forgive us, God. Grant us the simple wonder of the shepherds, the intelligent courage of the wise men, and the patient faith of Mary and Joseph, that we may journey with them to Bethlehem and find the good news of a child born for us. We need you, Lord. We are hopeless without you. We eagerly anticipate your arrival to earth the second time to make all things new and right. Come to us and by your grace, help us to receive you with love as you have loved us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Hey folks, this is a time in our worship service where we uh, give people an opportunity to, to, uh, to ponder, to pray, and to give. You'll see on the screen how you can give now at First McKinney. You can go online, you can text to give, or you can mail uh, your tithes and offerings to the church. And we, would, we have continued to be blown away by your faithfulness and generosity. And we just want to say thank you. Uh, just a last little update on Beyond, which is our missions emphasis. The church up to this point has given about $180,000 towards Beyond. And we know we have some other gifts that are coming in this week. And then in the way of child sponsorships, we've actually sponsored almost 160 of the kids. And that uh, represents about $100,000 a year that's going to go to those children to educate, to put some clothes on them, to tell them about Jesus, to make sure they have good medical care, and to feed them. And so we're very, very excited about that. So thank you again for your generosity. You're way, way amazing to us. Like I said, we continue to be blown away. And so this is our time to give. And just as Holly just saying about Emmanuel, uh, God with us, just that ought to that ought to make you get chills every time you think about it. God is with us. So let's pray together. Father, thanks for this moment, the season of offering and giving. Lord, thanks for the people of First McKinney and that they've been so faithful. God, even last weekend, Lord, we, we asked for people to pick up angel trees and every single one of the kids at Finch was, has been adopted. And Lord, uh, uh, in the next seven or eight days, those kids will get those gifts. And so thank you for Again, just every time we turn around and every time we, we put things in front of our folks about generosity and just 
about blessing our neighbors and our city and our country and our world that they're so faithful. And, and God, I, I know the reason why is because you've been so faithful to us, God. Lord, thanks that you are God with us. Um, that blows me away every time. And so thank you for that. And Lord, just uh, hear uh, this song now as a worship song to you and then speak through Bobby as he preaches. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Bobby Waite. I'm the mission mobilizer here at First McKinney. Um, 
A few days ago, Sam asked me if I would preach on this um, series, and I said yes. Little did I know that I, we would be uh, doing it this way in this time. Josh Willis uh, read us the information about the Advent candle for this week, and the word that was is chosen is this of anticipation. Um, I love it that we have this word at Christmas time that has this idea of looking forward. That idea that uh, the infant baby, the preborn baby, John the Baptist, in the womb, leaped for joy and anticipation of the newborn child, Jesus. It, it really does present this idea of hope. The uh, hope that we have at Christmas time that's very different from the hope that the world uh, speaks of. In the world's terms, hope is just wishful thinking, something that might or might not happen in the future. In Hebrews, uh, in the Bible, God tells us that faith is the confidence in things hoped for a proof of things unseen. You see, I think we as believers have this different idea of hope that it is sure knowledge of something that has not yet come to pass. And so I think um, in this day and age, during these times, we as followers of Jesus Christ have a hope that is very different from what the world has to offer. We're really going to be speaking to that this morning. Sam has been leading us through this series called Advent, What Are We Waiting For? And in this series, he looked at several passages of Scripture, and we'll look at passages of Scripture that um, are looking forward. What, what does the Bible tell us the future looks like. And this morning we're going to look at this passage of Scripture that addresses um, a, a very important question. And actually it's this question that um, every student has when they come into the classroom. The question that every student has before the lesson begins is pretty much the same. Watch this video. Professor Burnett, I know that class participation is 10% of our grade, but are the discussions themselves going to be on the test too? Uh, Gwyneth, my dear, everything will be on the test, and the test will be everything. But fear not. For in the end, every one of us will be tested, and every one of us will be found wanting. The question is, is there going to be a test, and is this going to be on the test? Let's take a minute and go back to 1 Corinthians 3. I encourage you at home to get out your Bible, to open your Bible to 1 Corinthians 3, I'll read 11 through 15. I ask that you follow along with me. No man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work, which he shall has built upon, remains, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work burns up, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. Let's pray. Father, I do ask that you take your word and you open our ears and so impress us with who you are and what you want us to do as you tell us through your revealed word that it changes our lives. Father, I pray that 
the message this morning, the words of my mouth, be acceptable in your sight. And that, Father, it be life-changing in the lives of believers here at First McKinney in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, as many of you know, I come from an educational background. And the fact is, in education, one of the things that we do, and some people say we do too much, is give tests. And I, I propose to you today that God gives us tests. If you look at God's Word, really from the beginning, there are these times where God evaluates how people are doing. In the very beginning, it tells us um, God came to Adam and Eve after he gave them very clear instructions, and then they acted upon it a little bit. He came to them and said, now, how are you doing? And he asked them, now, who told you you were naked? Um, there was a test involved in that. And then a little later on, the next generation, he came to Cain and he said, now where's your brother? And then uh, a little later in the Bible, it tells us he came to a man named Abram and he said, would you pack up your family and move to a faraway place that you know nothing about? Uh, yes, that was a test. And then later he said, would you take your son, your only son, God tested Abram by saying, would you take your son, your only son, go up the mountain to sacrifice him. With Moses, he said, would you go to Pharaoh and say, tell him, let my people go. Would um, He asked the children of Israel, um, when you're going through the desert, will you trust in me for the daily sustenance of life? With Joshua, he said, would you go conquer the land? With David, he said, would you go stand before a giant? With Daniel, he said, he tested him and said, would you stand in a foreign country um, and proclaim that I'm the one and only God? With Jonah, he said, would you go tell Nineveh? Um, how did he do? Um, with the disciples, he said, follow me. It was a test to see, were the disciples capable of dropping their nets and following Jesus? With Peter and John and later Paul, he said, would you trust me in the prison cell? I, I propose to you that this book is a book full of tests. Uh, when I began studying for this, I googled uh, God's judgment. And um, I came up with uh, this document that is seven pages long with small type, and they're all tests by which God, that God put out in front of humanity, where he said, um, I need you to evaluate how you're doing on the instructions that I've given you. God is a God of tests. And, and some say, oh, in 2020, we don't really talk about the judgment of God. But let me tell you this about any good teacher. As a good teacher, I'll tell you that they will fully equip a student to be successful. There's no good teacher that wants their student to make a bad grade on a test. So a teacher will do everything possible. God is the good teacher, truly has provided us with all of the instructions, with all of the ability and the help of the Holy Spirit that on every test that He gives us, we could be prepared to be successful. And so, yes, God is a God of tests, and it tells us about that, that um, I'll say, most important test here in 1 Corinthians 3. In verse 11, it says, No man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid in Jesus Christ. Yes. 
there is this eternal final exam. Um, it tells us in Ecclesiastes 2.14, God will bring every act to judgment, everything whether good or evil. And then in Romans 2, 16, he, it says, God will judge the secrets of mankind through Christ Jesus. God does give us tests. But then it, there's this test that um, happens, and we see it at the very end of the book of the Revelation. In Revelation 20, verse 12, it says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The books were opened, and the, another book was opened, uh, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from things which were written in the book according to the dead. That it's really clear that all people will be judged on what their foundation is. And in 1 Corinthians 3.11, it says, There can be no other foundation other than Jesus Christ. You know, the, the familiar verse in John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. Whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. But verses 17 and 18 go on to read like this. God didn't send His Son into the world so that the world, um, to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through Him. The one who believes in Him is not judged. The one who does not believe in Him has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. There's only one foundation that works. Um, we live in a world that if you ask someone um, the foundation of their faith, they might give you a variety of answers. If you said, uh, what would give one a relationship with God? Uh, there are those who say, I, I, I just hope I'm good enough. It's probably the number one answer. People want to think that if they're good enough, that God will accept them. That's not the foundation that works. Um, some think, oh, if, if I only am philanthropic enough, if I only give enough money away, then God will accept me. Others believe that if I only attend the right places, go to church, if I go to church, then God will accept me. Well, 1 Corinthians 3.11 makes it really clear there's only one foundation that works. And it's the person who believes that Jesus, the Son of God, died in their place because of their failure. When you believe in faith that Jesus died for you, then there's this restoration and freedom to um, live as God wants you to. So there really is this big final exam that God gives at the very end that says, Do you believe in my Son, Jesus Christ? It's a pass or fail exam. But it's not the only test that we have. Um, there is this test that it speaks of in verses 12, 12 through 15, where it says, Now, based upon the foundation, the building you build will be judged. It says, If any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, that there are a lot of choices available for us to build with. I propose to you that those building materials represent the choices that we make in life. And those choices are these things, our thoughts, actions, attitudes, words, and yes, the things we should have done, the omissions of life. And so these building materials represent these things in our lives. And then it says, these things in our lives are going to be measured. It says, each man's work, all these things will become evident that they'll be tested with fire. Now I'd like to turn to another Paul passage. In 2 Corinthians 5, uh, Paul speaks on the same subject where 
he says um, that we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deed in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. So all of these things right here that are perched in fire really do come before this judgment seat of Christ. Um, theologians will spend time um, discussing uh, when this judgment seat occurs. I think it occurs when everyone, when the sum total of believers come together, when we all are in heaven together, Christ sits on this seat, and we've, we've given this um, judgment seat a word. It's called the Bema seat. And it's interesting from where that word comes because um, Bema actually is a Hebrew word that means elevated or raised up. And so if you look in this picture of a synagogue, um, you'll see in the very center of this synagogue is this raised seat. And two things took place from this raised seat right here. The Word of God is proclaimed, and that is they, they pull out the scrolls, the Old Testament, um, God's Word that the, the Jews will read aloud. And from this seat right here, this raised seat, the Word of God is read. The second thing that happens from the Bema seat is that civil judgments are made. And so in the future, God is going to test us. He's going to test our thoughts, actions, attitudes, words, and yes, our omissions based upon God's word. It's really important to see that this thing that the Corinthians knew about. If you go back and look in Acts 18, there's a reference made as Paul was in Corinth to the judgment seat from which a pronouncement was made. They knew all about this. So from this judgment seat from which the Word of God is read, um, a judgment or a test is given. And it says, upon this um, we will be judged. So. Um, two things happen as a result of this test. Um, and here's, here's what doesn't happen. This test of our actions, attitudes, thoughts, omissions, and words um, is not a test that says whether or not we get into heaven, whether or not we have a relationship with God. That test, the great white throne, happens at the end, and it really is that basis by which we get to heaven, and it's Jesus and Jesus alone. But on this test, we're given rewards or not given rewards. Uh, my friend David even, uh, as I told him I was uh, teaching on this particular passage, gave me a really great line. He said he, he thought the Bema Seat Judgment was like an invitation to a banquet. And the reward or not, you're going to get to go to the banquet and eat the dinner, but you may or may not get the dessert. So um, in this, I think the great news, it tells us in here that we get a reward based upon how we respond in obedience to God's word. So I think there really are three things that we ask ourselves. First of all, are you prepared for the final exam? Um, it is coming. There, it, it's clear throughout Scripture that God does want us to have a relationship with Him, and it comes through His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you're prepared, if you by faith believe Jesus died for you, you pass the test and you have a relationship with God restored and freed up to live the life that God wants you to. But the second 
question that we should be asking ourselves is, are we studying for this test? You know, are we listening to God speak? Um, are we willing to be obedient to the things that we are learning? Uh, Sam has taught us about discipleship and studying God's Word in, in this very appropriate method, the SOS method. What does God's Word say? How should we be obedient? And to whom will we share this? Um, in January, Sam is going to go through a passage and uh, take the time to go through this. What does it say? How should we obey and to whom should we share? SOS. It really is about how are we daily uh, doing the work necessary so that when we stand before God and He looks at the sum total of our thoughts, actions, attitudes, words, and yes, those things that we've omitted, how have we been obedient to God's Word? And lastly, it's, it's really how are we doing on the daily work. The things that we do daily prepare us for the exams that we take. And I, I, I propose to you that there are really two kinds of people um, with their attitude about tests. There are those who like the test and those who don't like the test. And... Really, the dividing point is this. If someone is prepared for the test, if they've done the studying, they're looking forward to it. The person who is uh, not looking forward to it, who is dreading the test that's coming their way, is that person who's not prepared for the test. So I tell you today, um, this passage of Scripture from 1 Corinthians 3, that we need to examine our foundation. Um, have we laid a foundation that is Jesus Christ alone? And then how are we building upon that foundation? Are we using the material that God has given us in His Word to be obedient, to have the, the thoughts, actions, attitudes, words, and, and do those things that God has called upon us to do. Or are we going to miss the dessert and fail to be obedient to the Word of God? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you um, do not leave us alone. That you, as the good teacher, have given us clear instructions about how we should live our lives. And then, Father, that you hold us accountable. I pray that we as we move forward with one another, that we'll sharpen one another to be obedient to your word. And Father, I pray that as we move on in this season of Advent, that we show a lost and dying world that our hope is different because of the gift of your son, Jesus. In his name, amen. Hey, folks. Um as you respond to what God has just told you in the service, uh, bless you and thank you. And we want to just let you know, if you, if you have some sort of a decision that God's led you to this morning, that there's, some, there's a text number on the screen right now, and you can text us and let us know the decision that you made. If you've come to faith in Christ, you can just text in there, rescue. If you have a prayer request, you can text that in. And like I say, we, would, we will follow up with you very, very quickly, and we would look forward to doing that. And just finally, um, this is a, an amazing season. Like I say, Sam and Justin getting sick wasn't really planned, but they're, they're getting better, and we're thankful. So from the standpoint of COVID updates, just check the website, and we will give you updates. Right now, the offices are going to be closed through Wednesday, and uh, hopefully Sam and Justin will be well on the way to mending by then, and we'll look forward to gathering uh, next week. We will let you know on the website what that looks like. So... Remember Christmas Eve, and uh, it is a great chance to bring your neighbors to something. Uh, maybe they won't come to anything in the whole year, but they'll come to Christmas Eve with their families. And so we have four services. Take advantage of that. It's an opportunity. Bless you. Have a great day.